Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm senior fellow and director of the Europe program. As I was entering this room, I said, this feels like a family reunion. My goodness, my goodness. And I think the foreign minister was seeing many, many friends and acquaintances that he hasn't seen for a while. So we welcome you again. I have to say, two days before the Thanksgiving holiday on an, and on a rainy day. You are a hearty lot and we thank you very, very much for joining us. We are extremely grateful to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund because it's due to their generosity this morning that we can gather here today to talk about uh, two very critical international issues that unfortunately are not getting perhaps the attention and the focus due to uh, a lot of uh, economic noise, shall we say, uh, emanating from Europe, from the United States, from the global economy. But this conference and today's uh, release of a report uh, co-authored uh, by my colleague, Janusz Bugajski, uh, senior associate here at, the, uh, uh, at CSIS and, and of the Europe program, uh, we're releasing a new report, and if there's one thing I want to leave with you today after we're done with our conversation is the phrase, time for change. Uh, this is uh, certainly the approach that Janusz and I took to the report. Uh, it was going to be a very brief policy memo. It turned into a little longer than we had anticipated, but we felt it was absolutely vital to, to give a recap of where the transatlantic community has uh, gone, particularly in Bosnia, over the last 16 years, since yesterday's 16th anniversary of the original signing of the Dayton Peace Accords. So where did we go in the last 16 years? But most most importantly, where are we heading in the next 16 years? And we hope that this conversation will be uh, an examination of a time for change and a change in transatlantic policy and approach. Not only is it a time for change, it is a time for questioning assumptions. And today, uh, as we watch the stock market go up and down and up and down, we know that we have to test some assumptions about the future of the European Union integration project if the uh, ongoing financial crisis uh, it cannot uh, allow the EU to deepen and widen as US policy towards this region assumes. It is also time for questioning the future U.S. role in the region and to see what, what the United States will continue uh, to pursue in the years to come. So we hope as you listen to today's conference and we hope before you leave, if you haven't already done so, to take a copy of our report. Um, we want to demonstrate that there are differences of, of approach between the United States and Europe towards uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo as well as Bosnia. We want to instill in policymakers a deep desire for change, that the status quo is no longer a viable approach. And certainly your presence today in the room does exactly what we wanted to accomplish, which was raise the awareness in Washington that this region has some unfinished business and we need to galvanize our policymakers to renew their focus and their interest. And with this lead off, I can think of no one better to begin our discussion than the foreign minister, Sven Al Alkali, and a man who needs no introduction to this room, uh, but as the current foreign minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, uh, Minister Alkali, you have been a uh, long serving ambassador here in Washington from 1994 to 2000. That's why you have so many friends in this room, but has also served from 2004 to 2007 as the ambassador to the Kingdom of Belgium and the head of the mission to NATO. So, steeped, you are the transatlantic approach, my friend, and we look forward to your comments. Please join me in welcoming Foreign Minister Sven Akalai. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as Heather mentioned, there are really so many good friends. We worked on the Bosnia issue for a long time since uh, first my arrival in Washington and the end of 93. So I've been in uh, this uh, business for a long, long time. Uh, 
if I get the benefited stage for this, uh, it might help. <laughs> uh, so it's it's like a homecoming to this forum. To see CSIS was always excellent forum for the issues on Bosnia Herzegovina. When we work closely with Janos and the other friends, also with the big Brzezinski, who was very instrumental in many, many of the policies which were created. So we always uh, think of best of this institute as one of the leading institutes in Washington, policy makers and uh, those who are uh, creating and influencing policies of the United States and not only in the United States, the world worldwide. So I'm really honored and uh, pleased that I got the invitation. Heather, thank you once again for also your kind introduction today. During my tenure, as you mentioned, in, uh, as ambassador in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Washington, D.C., I, uh, I addressed this forum in a in number, in number of occasions. And uh, during all my years in Washington, I had the privilege to be the first ambassador of Bosnia, Herzegovina, to, and to participate in the negotiation of the Washington Agreement. Then uh, that means creation of Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Dayton Peace Talks and many other developments that are important and crucial for Bosnia-Herzegovina. So ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, as I mentioned, we marked 16th anniversary of Dayton Peace Accords, which ended the war and created a constitutional and political framework for the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. But interestingly enough, the date was not celebrated in the whole of Bosnia-Herzegovina. In Republika Srpska, it, is a, it was a national holiday, celebrating what some call getting an autonomous state within Bosnia-Herzegovina. And looking back on those 16 years since the Dayton Peace Accords, what can we say? There has been progress and achievements in a number of areas. I will mention just a few of the achievements in Bosnia-Herzegovina. On the path to EU, so signing the Stabilization and Association Agreement with the EU, which was signed in June 2008, and all the countries, member states of EU, have ratified it. Citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina got the travel visa-free into Schengen states, and we get a status uh, that our visas to get into the United States are valid for 10 years now. Bosnia and Herzegovina was elected as a non-permanent member state of United Nations Security Council for the period 2010-2011, and our term ends this December. I think our participation in our uh, Security Council was uh, perceived by the other countries, not by us, as, as a very important and very constructive role. Uh, another very important issue on the path to NATO was uh, that Bosnia-Herzegovina got into membership action plan, which is the last uh, uh, step, last stage before full membership. The, uh, under the conditions which I'll be talking later on, because on the very successful defense reform in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And taking into account that major reforms were made until 2006 and uh, years after, we see no significant movement in the past years, which resulted in stagnation on the EU and NATO path. Bosnia and Herzegovina is the only country in the region that it did not submit the, its application to become EU member due to not being able to fulfill the necessary conditions. The same goes for the NATO accession, that the major issues become state defense property as a condition to move forward. The last example of this stagnation was when the law on state aid, one of the conditions to present our application to uh, EU, was on the agenda of the House of Representatives of Bosnia-Herzegovina. The law proposed by a minister for trade and economic relations, who is a Bosnian Serb, adopted fully with concessions with the Council of Ministers, with all ethnic groups voting for it, has been rejected by the House of Representatives by Bosnian Serbs Member of Parliament. The main reason for all of this is the fact that the Dayton Peace Agreement has not been implemented in its central parts. Agreement has not been implemented and instead has been continuously adjusted to the realities on the ground. 
which have resulted from the systematic violation of the agreement and not to the, the other way around. Most of the problems and challenges that Bosnia and Herzegovina faces today stem from the failure to implement the central elements of the Dayton Peace Agreements, particularly its Annex 7. For those uh, who are not familiar with all this number of annexes, uh, this annex guarantees the right of all refugees and uh, displaced persons freely to return to their homes of origin in safety and right confirmed by this, uh, 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 this agreement. As a result of the systematic and continuous violations of the Annex 7, out of some 47% of non-Serbs who lived in Republic of Serbska entity before they were either killed or cleansed, only 8% of them live there now. The failure to implement the Annex 7 has resulted in the most serious constitutional problem facing Bosnia and Herzegovina today, the so-called entity voting mechanism which was intended as a safeguard for the legitimate territorial interest of the two entities, as perceived by all three constituent peoples, has morphed into mechanism by which one ethnic group from one entity blocks the state without any input from the other constituent peoples. And this mechanism continues to be used as if the Annex 7 had been fully implemented. Right now, the House of Representatives in Bosnia-Herzegovina, as an example, has 42 members of parliament. 28 of them come from Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and 14 of them are from Republika Srpska. Of all these 14 coming from Republika Srpska, not a single one is a Bosnian Croat or Bosniak. They are all Bosnian Serbs. That tells you that uh, return Annex 7 has not been implemented fully. The entity voting mechanism allows only 10 Serb deputies elected from Republika Srpska entity, who constitutes only 22% of the parliament's 42 deputies, to block any proposed decision of the parliament of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And over these 14 years, those 10 deputies have used entity voting to block over 260 proposed laws. In construct, the parliament passed less than 150 laws in the same period. This ethnic monopoly, or particularly veto power on territorial interest solidified ethnic division, renders the state dysfunctional and in turn perpetuates instability. Or, as Mr. Dodik, the president of Republika Srpska, puts in himself, and I quote, we have demonstrated that we are ready and capable of defending our autonomy and our values. It should be said that our concept is that for Republika Srpska to be mo more independent in Bosnia-Herzegovina and for our rights to be reinstated." End quote. Obviously, this view is not shared by all the political factors in Bosnia-Herzegovina. But this fact on entity voting was confirmed by very prestigious institutions worldwide. First, United States Congress in its resolution, European Commission, the European Parliament, Council of Europe, and the Venice Commission, who have all rightfully identified entity voting as the main obstacles to the efforts of transform Bosnia-Herzegovina into a viable and self-sustainable country, capable of functioning in the absence of the Office of High Representative. All of these institutions have recommended that the entity voting must be eliminated or reformed, and all of their recommendations have so far been ignored. To put this into perspective, to the U.S. Constitution, provides federal government with 18 enumerated responsibilities. The rest are essentially left to the states. But neither level of the government can block the other from exercising its respective responsibilities. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, the state has 14 enumerated responsibilities, which is close enough to the U.S. model, and the rest are granted to the entities. However, while the state cannot prevent the entities from exercising their responsibility, one entity can and does block the state from exercising its own. This is due to the fact that the failure of sustainable return has caused the decision-making process in the state parliament to morph into ethno-territorial voting mechanism, whereby Republika Srpska entity represents only one ethnic group. The second fundamental problem the question of a state property stems from the fact that the right given to the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina through Annex 4, the Constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 
annex uh, our constitution as a part of peace deal have been set aside in favor of political compromises necessitated by the realities on the ground. Under Article 1 of the Dayton Constitution, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a sole legal successor of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Social Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and as such, it remains the owner of all property registered to these predecessors. Similarly, under succession agreement, Bosnia and Herzegovina is the owner of all former Yugoslavia property on its territory. The entities have no ownership rights on basis for claims over any such property. Bosnia and Herzegovina ownership of the state property is the right guaranteed by the first article of the Dayton Constitution and was unequivocally confirmed as such by a final and binding verdict of the State Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The court, created by the Office of High Representative, generously funded and supported by many of your government, and staffed by international judges and prosecutors from an even greater number of international countries from international community. It is therefore unacceptable to seek consensus to implement this existing law or to seek political compromise with those who block its implementation. The same mistake was made when a high representative imposed the entity-based privatization in 1998 with obvious negative consequences for return of refugees, consolidation of single economic space, and reintegration of the society. Just to make a very important point, one of the demands made by Slobodan Milosevic in Dayton, and I can vividly remember that, was to divide the state property between the entities. He did not achieve this goal, and it's puzzling that some still insist on this demand. It is true that Bosnia and Herzegovina has two entities by the Dayton Peace Agreement, but that agreement also preserves the legal continuity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, including, of course, the ownership of the state property. This was one of the key balances that made Dayton possible and it also serves as a primary factor between the two entities. The state property is a central to Dayton and it is in the two entity structure. Ladies and gentlemen, Security Council of United Nations had a very good reason for insisting on the implementation of Dayton Agreement in its entire, entirety when it adopted Resolution 1031. The solution of a myriad of difficult compromises built into Dayton ensured that agreement would function if and only if all the elements of, are fully implemented. Non-implementation of one of the elements made many other difficult, or if not impossible, to function. So it's not the sheer arbitrariness on this list that is disconcerting, but the fact that the closure of Office of High Representative rather than date on implementation has become a goal in, it, in and of itself. And one of the central elements of Dayton has been marked for a change in order to serve that goal, namely Bosnia-Herzegovina ownership of state property. This, ladies and gentlemen, will not lead to the Dayton implement implementation in its entirety, but more likely to its demise. Dayton was a difficult compromise, creating necessity for a number of its elements to function in unison. The Office of High Representative was put in place to ensure precisely such functioning, not to give legitimacy to an a la carte implementation just so it can leave. If the OHR mission had morphed from the full implementation mode to the departure mode, we can only conclude that such transformation is not in accordance with the clear language of this Council Resolution 1031. At the same time, we cannot be expected to provide assistance for this transformation. Not only do we take our in internal obligations, uh, including uh, Security Council resolution seriously. We moreover remain conscious that the dangers facing Bosnia and Herzegovina if Dayton central elements are slowly reduced, modified, or completed, take, completely taken away. For that, ladies and gentlemen, if one of central elements is on the table, so must be all others. And as stated by the international community, and particularly the US, the objective 
of having a single state of Bosnia-Herzegovina capable of fulfilling its domestic and internal obligation is to be achieved. Two things must be done. First, the state must be given a political life of its own that is independent of the entities. The state must be able to carry out its stated responsibilities through a fully democratic process, at the same time contains protection from the vital interest of each ethnic group. Bosnia-Herzegovina is a complex country, and those vital ethnic interests must be protected. But no country, including Bosnia-Herzegovina, can function as a viable state if every decision can be blocked. Unless reform is undertaken in this direction, the debate about what specific responsibilities the state should have in the future is misguided. We could transfer all responsibilities to the state level, but that would be a futile exercise if the state has no me mechanism to implement them in the entities. Second, in order to achieve the first objective, the country's leadership must be elected from the entire territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Due to obstruction of refugee return, today's politicians are forced to appeal to their ethnic base only. By electing their representative at the state level from the country as a whole, the waters, voters will be able to choose between those who offer concrete economic and social programs and those who are mired in the politics in the past. The political elites will in turn have no, to concentrate on building appeal that transcends ethnic lines and that truly serves the real interest of all the citizens in the country, not just the perceived interest of individual ethnic group. Moreover, the elected, elected representative will have to mandate of, it, of the entire country when carrying out the state responsibilities, greatly eliminating incentive and tolerance for blockades. The debate about future of Bosnia-Herzegovina has, has for far too long been steered towards the wrong issues. The issue is not whether Bosnia-Herzegovina has multiple levels of government aimed towards uh, the separation of powers. The issue is whether the state can exercise its responsibility without being prevented to do so by the entities. The issue is whether there will be a viable, functional Bosnia-Herzegovina with a true separation of powers or a dysfunctional Bosnia-Herzegovina in which the entities decide how and when the state shall exercise the powers that clearly has under the Constitution. And today's situation, when Bosnia-Herzegovina is uh, lagging behind in all reforms on EU and NATO path within the neighboring countries, when conditions are not met by BH authorities, when our Constitution is discriminatory to the extent that all citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina are not equal or eligible to elect to certain political office in the country, and that after 14 months after the election, we cannot form the Council of Ministers, i.e. government. All this shows that there are serious problems in the implementation of Dayton in moving country forward. When we are hearing calls for referendum for secession, continued obstruction for politicians from Republika Srpska, calls for the creation of the third ethnic ethnically pure entity, we have to step back and say that serious steps must be made by the international community to preserve Bosnia-Herzegovina as a state and not to allow a new crisis to evolve in Balkans. I'm not talking about the possibility to slip back into the violence or armed conflict, God forbid, war that is a very remote possibility. But we must ensure that Bosnia-Herzegovina has functional institutions and introduce reforms necessary for Euro-Atlantic integration. <coughs> All mentioned deficiencies cannot be changed in a parliamentary procedure because there's no political will to do so, and constitutional obstacles mentioned earlier, which are used and abused, especially from the Republika Srpska side, which is steering towards the creation of a state within state. Please note that these are not my words, but the words of the leadership of Republika Srpska said and repeated over and over. So we have to look for a new ways of moving the country forward. Fact of the matter is that Dayton peace accords, which have ended the war and the bloodshed in Bosnia-Herzegovina, allow allowed my country's progress, as we have certainly advanced to where we are today. But at this point, within this framework, we cannot move forward. But Bosnia and Herzegovina cannot make the next crucial step that will propel Bosnia and Herzegovina into Euro-Atlantic integration. At this point in time, my country needs more than Dayton can offer. 
Therefore, new ideas are welcome. And one of those is a possible conference on constitutional changes to, to remove the obstacles preventing Bosnia-Herzegovina to move forward. This gathering ought to be convened by US, European Union, and Russia. To, then together with other signatories of Dayton Accords, these changes in the new era for democratic, peaceful, and prosperous state of Bosnia-Herzegovina with efficient and functioning institutes can be launched. It is my sincere hope the discussions today uh, will take place here, uh, will help us, and the proposals that brought before us will, will bring uh, forward to such uh, goals, and we will offer, it will offer new perspectives for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. Well, let me throw out the, uh, throw out the first question. Um, and, and if I can tease out a bit of this, the conference on constitutional change. Um, as being there 16 years ago, as Dayton was signed, what are the critical elements of that, uh, of that conference? And in the 16 years, if you could provide your insights on how the roles of the US and the European Union have changed, in your view, uh, over those last, last 16 years, and what do you need from both Washington and Brussels in the future to help move through these very intransient uh, itch issues, whether that's entity voting or on the state or, or on state property? Uh, thank you for this question, and. Uh, I mentioned the problems, and uh, I was not able to give the answers. If I could, I, I would gladly do. We did a, a couple of uh, attempts to do constitutional changes. Everybody here who follows Bosnia-Herzegovina remembers April package, which was uh, uh, done in April 2006. Then was this second attempt, the Butmir, so-called Butmir process, uh, in the military barracks. Uh, near Sarajevo, so everybody resembles a Butmir, Dayton, maybe there'll be a success story. No, but, but the proposed uh, things was, uh, and I can say just my opinion, because uh, I was not part of the negotiation. There were some only party leaders, and uh, my friend Miroslav Lajcak was there, uh, would remember more in details. Uh, uh, I, I can say just my personal opinion. Uh, the, the proposals who had done that will fall short. In April package, there were really good proposals, except having the flow, which was entity voting, because then entity voting could be used in the, in the parliament of Bosnia-Herzegovina to elect uh, someone you liked and who will be obeyed. So if you don't uh, like someone, you just uh, uh, pull uh, entity voting and, uh, and then uh, he won't be elected. So. And there was another flaw that after three unsuccessful attempts to elect uh, chairman of the council ministers or even a member of presidency, we would be into new elections. So we can be, by the will of this entity voting, on the continuous perpetuous uh, 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 elections trends on the state level. I have to. At the same time, on the entity level would thrive. They would. We can function without uh, any impact on the state. But uh, what, what is uh, known to everybody, to become member of EU and NATO, the entities cannot. Only the states can become members. So I think we have to make uh, state institutions uh, uh, much for, uh, better, more functional. That's why we need constitutional changes to eliminate. And if, if we should judge uh, what US Congress said, what Venice Commission, what EU Parliament, what the uh, Council of European Union said, and they notified that's the main uh, reason, uh, then we should, I think, move in that direction because there are much more uh, experts over there in those institutions than, than uh, myself. Uh, my, my party, Party for BH, uh, was accused of uh, turning down this uh, April package. But I have to remember all of, all of here who are, that uh, there was uh, this uh, abolish entity voting, we will vote for April package because uh, that was the, the major, major thing. Butmir package had, uh, it was done under the EU leadership, 
which, which uh, gave some solutions which were not accept accepted by anyone. Uh, those who are for Bosnia and those who are for, for different options. So uh, it was not accepted by all the parties and uh, uh, it was rejected. We are always for to have a good tries to have to, to, to see. But what I think, uh, it's not that I'm uh, uh, today in this country, but I, I believe without US leadership things would not happen. It's not insult to EU, sorry, <laughs> Miroslav, but I think uh, it happened during the war, I experienced when uh, U.S. had a policy, we don't have dog in this fight. You remember John Harper? <laughs> Jim remembers that very well. Until, and that was my main, uh, to bring and uh, U.S. to get involved. And we had this contact group and uh, uh, it was very large support. So I believe we have to have all these three players, EU, U.S., EU, and Russia because without Russia definitely we cannot do. They should be involved, but uh, I think U.S. has to take a leadership. I'll stop here. I'm Mike Haltzell from the Center for Transatlantic Relations, Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, Sven, um, aside from the, the usual suspects, the players that uh, were not able to get the April package through and not working at Butmir plus the Russians, of course. Uh, what about making a role in a, in a conference on constitutional change? What about making a role for civil society in Bosnia? Um, some of the civil society groups transcend the entity borders, would give uh, democratic legitimacy. I know most people, when they hear civil society, think it'll be a food fight, but you know, we have a, uh, an example in the OSCE, much, much larger group than, you know, simply Bosnia-Herzegovina, that uh, is giving civil society an increasing voice in its sessions. Uh, I'm saying a voice, they obviously don't have a final vote, but they have a significant voice. What about, what about carving out a role for civil society in this conference? Wonderful question. If I can just take one or two more gentlemen to the right, Alex, and then Ambassador Kozarich there, and then you can wrap up. Okay. Uh, Obrad Kasich, uh, TSM Global Consultants. Uh, Mr. Minister, your speech laid out very well the position of Sarajevo as to uh, the talks on constitutional reform. I'm wondering uh, how do you uh, see the implementation of your ideas given that both of the crucial things that you identified are opposed, uh, the first one opposed by the Republika Srpska and the second one opposed both by Republika Srpska and the major Croatian parties in Bosnia. Other, it seems to me that the implication was that you see that the international community would impose these type of solutions. Is, did I misread that? Uh, Rich Kozlerich, George Mason University. Uh, welcome back to Washington, Mr. Minister. Good to see you again. Um, if the politicians of Bosnia and Herzegovina cannot form a government after 14 months, how are they going to be able to agree on a new constitution? Tough. Fire away. Official is uh, not an easy task. Trust me. <laughs> I used to have a uh, dark hair when I oh. came to <laughs> Washington, and you see what's happening now. It's like snow. It's outside. Uh, now I I'll go questions, um, Michael. Uh, thank you. I think you cannot have a better supporter for role of civil society in me. We, we need, and you, can, you have so, uh, as you said, transcend ethnic lines. They're so eloquent, they're so el uh, knowledgeable, they are really present the situation, and uh, obviously uh, any constitutional changes should go beyond political leaders. It should be put before the people, before the parliaments, and also before the people where the people have their say. All this, uh, maybe one of the flaws of this, any, any was, uh, of this constitutional changes was because it was always in the closed circles. It was not accepted by the political leaders or group of political leaders of all of them. But uh, at the end, who raised the hands is the parliamentarians who are listening their party bosses. Unfortunately, that's why it's important to threaten the role 
of civil society, of those ground roots groups to have their say much stronger and uh, they can threaten not to elect these officials in a next elections, which are really around the corner in 2014. It's not that, that far. So I would uh, support fully this, and I think uh, those who would be discussing and thinking on, on a Dayton Plus or Dayton 2, whatever, it's uh, some kind of conference should take and envisage strong role of uh, civil society. We know what, what uh, the NGOs were able to do in Serbia. It's a vivid example how this power of voice uh, of people can be heard and can be heard very loud. So we should do it in Bosnia. I think uh, we have good groups, knowledgeable groups, but we have to give them a chance. So thank you for this. My friend Obrat. okay. Uh, of course I'm expecting that he will say policies of Sarajevo. But this is once uh, has to be uh, made clear. Even Republika Srpska and Federation are in Bosnia-Herzegovina. In spite of the, those calls, we hate Bosnia-Herzegovina. We are in a tight, uh, we cannot progress in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We want to do this and that. This is position of a viable state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And if all the entities work together in a, in a good faith, I think we could create very good country. I'll take you one example. Uh, visa liberalization process. We got a map, road map for this. Very difficult things to achieve. But it was in a common interest for this uh, visa liberalization to appeal to the electorate, to give them visa free travel in Europe. Even in Republika Srpska, they decided to transfer some authority or so-called sovereignty of the entity to the state level. It had to be, so we believe that placing Bosnia and Herzegovina into the European Union as soon as possible can be a format where the entities and the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina can find its way, both without saying, oh, we are endangering the, the entity status or we are taking authorities from, uh, transferring authorities from the entity to, to the state. No one is taking because all, if we move forward, will bring benefit to all the citizens. And we have to start thinking in that sense, not to look, oh, what would I do for my entity, for my people. That's why I was proponing maybe different uh, uh, election, election law, which would bring more transparency to that you answer to every citizen of Bosnia and Herzegovina, not to appeal to your ethnic group. And then, of course, you're saying, oh, you see, there's a terrorism, there's a Wahhabis all over Bosnia, they are after uh, Christians or whatever. So uh, I believe uh, we should not look uh, to the uh, policies as Sarajevo policies, as policies of Bosnia, Herzegovina. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think you impose differently. I was not imposing that anything uh, in that sense, what you were mention, mentioning. I was uh, saying that we should be working for Bosnia Herzegovina together and to move forward because European Union, for all the countries of former Yugoslavia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, is the best possible format to achieve all the rights of all the ethnic groups, of all the peoples, and uh, bringing them better, better standard of living. And uh, answer to be short to uh, the Ambassador Kozlerich, uh, uh, forming the government. I think that's not the main goal. Everybody think that forming the government, it's going to, to solve all these problems of our accession to EU or NATO. No, why we, we don't have form, form government so far? I think what is important to here to understand the package that reforms are adopted. It easier would be later to divide the chairs, who would be playing clarin, who would be trombone, who would be doing this and that. But I think we have to agree, and I, I tend to agree with this policy, is that we look for the package to fulfill this conditionality necessary to move on EU, to fulfill the conditionality to move on NATO. These are two critical issues and to hold the census in Bosnia Herzegovina. If political leaders who will be creating majority in the new parliament would agree on the on those uh, main issue, I don't think that the pr would be a big problem in distribution of the chairs of the, uh, the uh, in the council ministers.
Ms. Rockley, thank you so much for those comments, and please join me in thanking the minister.